Attention digital nomads. Do you need a notary? The shop co-working space has you covered. With a community team of registered notaries, they can help you check that task off your list anytime during business hours. You can even book ahead. Take a virtual tour of the shop's beautiful co-working space at shopworkspace.com. And if you want to try it out for a day, just bring seven pantry items for their food drive. You'll get a day pass in exchange. Here's what Salt Lake's talking about. God help us, we are still in this mayoral election. And with the debates in the rearview mirror, we offer a little analysis here. A vision for our city can be hard to lay in a soundbite. So who are those soundbites for? And do they change minds? It's Wednesday, November 15th. I'm Ali Vallarta, and this is CityCast Salt Lake. Executive producer Emily Means, there were a lot of debates for the Salt Lake City mayoral candidates this election season. Honestly, thank God we didn't host one. (laughs) But you watched a handful of them. Yeah. And I want to know what you learned. First, I would like to present to you my central thesis. In this essay, I will. uh, From listening to these three mayoral candidates, Aaron Mendenhall, Rocky Anderson, Michael Valentine, go back and forth and back and forth on a stage, you know, over and over again. Okay. Who you choose in this mayoral race comes down to what you believe the role of Salt Lake City's mayor is in the context Mm. of our Republican legislature and our Republican-led state. That's my central thesis. I don't think it's how will the next mayor handle the Great Salt Lake. Like, I don't think that. I think it comes down to what you believe the role of Salt Lake City's mayor is in this Democratic stronghold, a blue dot in a red state, when it comes to our relationship with Republican leaders. Any questions? Well, thank you for um, defending your thesis, Dr. Means. The panel would like to know that this is a very interesting assertion because what I hear when you say that is Mayor Aaron Mendenhall is winning the communications game (laughs) because she has from the jump framed this race as being about what you think the city's role in these issues is in relationship with the Republican supermajority legislature. Like that's like always been her framing. I would say for the past three years, that's how she's framed most issues. So, I mean, she's establishing a little bit of dominance in this race already, if that feels like the central thesis at the end of it. Now, listen, this is just my conclusion, okay? Okay. (laughs) I'm just a random gal who's been paying attention to the Salt Lake City mayoral race for months and months and months. Right, right. I'm not saying you're endorsing, but like controlling the narrative is important. Yeah. Let's lay out what these two possible roles could look like. Erin Mendenhall has very clearly said that she believes the best role <laughs> that where you can get the most done as mayor of Salt Lake City is to, in her words, be at the table with the state. Um, she really views herself as a bridge builder. She views herself as someone who can walk into these difficult discussions with state leaders and keep a calm head about her. But let me tell you about the bridge builder. Here's what bridge builders can get done as the mayor of Salt Lake City. Incremental progress, I think. It may mean that you're giving something up at the negotiating table. This is kind of how I'm coming at it. You know, maybe she feels differently, but this is how I view it. Um, Meanwhile, on the other end of the spectrum, we have what I'm going to call uh, like a maverick mayor in all of this. And the maverick might be seen as more aggressive on some issues, putting out this message that this is what Salt Lake City is going to do, regardless of whether the legislature likes it or not. And that Mm. might mean that the legislature writes a law in retaliation, or it might mean that the city has to sue the state over an issue or something like that. I can't tell you which mayor should represent us, because we've had both of these types of mayors in Salt Lake City's history, right? Yes, we have. Mm -hmm. So, 
I'm just laying it out on the table. This is how I see it. And my DMs are not open. Well, and specifically, I mean, if we think about the run up to the election of Mayor Aaron Mendenhall, former Mayor Jackie Biskupski, I think I would categorize as a maverick mayor based on your definition here. Sure. And it felt like there were times when she was ready to go up there and throw a shoe at the legislature over the Inland Port, which she went hard against the Inland Port. Mm -hmm. Let us never forget. And at the time when current Mayor Aaron Mendenhall was on the city council, there were a lot of people in the city who felt like she was, quote unquote, the adult in the room in some of these negotiations and on behalf of the council saying, well, wait a minute, like we have to figure out how we work within this framework because this toothpaste is out of the tube. We know they're going to do whatever they want. Fighting with them on it is not going to put us in a better position at the end of it all. And that kind of got her elected. Like, that's how she made a name for herself. And that cadence is what voters chose. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that we're three years later back at the same crossroads. It does feel like we always end up in this place, whether it's a mayoral election or even like a legislative seat. Exactly, Allie. It's the... Are you a de- you're a Democrat exactly. headed up to the hill? Do you play chess or checkers? And listen, I do think there is room for both of these roles. And especially when it comes to the state legislature, right? Like the supermajority Republican legislature just completely dwarfs how many Democrats are there. And so I do think there is a place for the Democrats who are, you know, like former state senator Jim DeBacchus, like shaking your fist and staging protests and making these big sweeping statements on the floor of the Senate Mm -hmm. for your cause. I think there is a place for that. But then, you know, we've got like Representative Angela Romero, who I think people would say is a very effective legislator, um, even as a Democrat, in getting, you know, like these little incremental bills through that her Republican colleagues agree on. So it's a little bit different when it comes to the Salt Lake City mayor's office because people want their mayor to get a lot done. So I do think it's a hard position to be in. Yeah, it is. Well, let's talk about the debates themselves. How did the candidates conduct themselves? Like, how did this all play out on the stage? Anything juicy? Well, a little bit. It got juicier and juicier as these debates went on, I feel like. And but right from the get go, you know, Rocky Anderson and Michael Valentine came out swinging against Aaron Mendenhall. Uh, The very first debate I went to was not posed as a debate, but instead a forum on homelessness. And I do think that Aaron was quite measured in that situation. And that that was the purpose of setting it up as a forum too, right? Like the host said, well, we're not looking for sound bites. You know, we're not looking for quips. We want this to be a, a proper discussion. And I don't know if that's exactly how it played out. But as time went on and these debates went on, I do think that Erin got kind of sick of getting beat up on. So she started coming back with her own quips or like her own critiques of of the other candidates on stage, specifically about Rocky, uh, because he has a record. Yeah, there was a moment during this election cycle that I thought was really interesting. And it was when the Salt Lake Tribune announced their debate in partnership mm. with Uh, KUED. You remember this? And it was one of the bigger debates because it was on TV. Yeah. And they didn't invite Michael Valentine, the candidate in this race. Mm -hmm. And on that note, we've seen very little polling. Do you not find that interesting? I don't think there's any external polling in this race. Do you find it interesting, though? Yes, I do. And let's talk about that in a minute. But I do want to say, like, he was not invited to the debate. He was upset about that. He raised a ruckus saying that he should be invited. He's a candidate. He's filed. And I mean, he is kind of right because there is no real metric to lean on. It's kind of just vibes. So if you don't invite him just because like that isn't necessarily fair. But Rocky Anderson put out this statement saying that absolutely Michael Valentine should be invited to the debate. And even I think there was a quote in the statement that was like, even if a candidate has absolutely no chance of winning, they should still be able to participate in our democracy. As this election cycle has gone on and we've gotten closer and closer to Election Day, I do think that we've seen them kind of team up a little bit more during Mm -hmm. these debates. You know, moderators have asked, "Okay, well, this is our rank choice voting election. Who are you going to rank as your second choice? And 
Aaron says no one. And Rocky and Michael say they're going to rank each other and they encourage their supporters to rank each other. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Although Michael Valentine has since withdrawn his support from Rocky as his second choice. Wait, that's such a good question, too, (laughs) on behalf of the moderator. Yeah, right? I know. I was like, oh, things got interesting. Thanks, ranked choice voting. Hey, Salt Lake. I know a lot of podcasts are trying to sell you mattresses in a box, but I'm sorry, no. If I'm gonna spend 50 hours a week laying on something, I've got to try it first. So I'm going hard for Mattress Warehouse. Shop a locally owned store and still access all the top brands. Tempur-Pedic, Sealy, Purple, Serta. These are the icons of sleep, and I'm relaxed just thinking about them. With seven locations along the Wasatch Front, it's easy to pop in and let them custom fit you to a mattress. Because let's be honest, a good sleep foreshadows a great day. Mattress Warehouse offers interest-free financing and a comfort guarantee. In November, everything will be on sale and you can save up to a grand on Black Friday. Tell them we sent you and get a free pillow with your purchase. Find the location nearest you at mattresswarehouseutah.com. Hey, Salt Lake. If you've ever wondered if you can pull off cowboy boots, you should pull on a pair of Tacovas this fall. With a new store open right here in Salt Lake City, it's never been easier to get fitted into a great pair of boots, and you'll enjoy them for years to come. Let me tell you how Tacovas are made. Each pair of boots is crafted by hand in over 200 individual steps. They use premium bovine and exotic hides, and they're designed not just for style, but for comfort. Step into Tacova's City Creek store, and you'll be greeted with a friendly smile and the rich aroma of fine leather. The Salt Lake store offers complimentary boot shines and custom leather stamping to make your new boots future heirlooms that can be passed down for generations. Head over to City Creek, step into a new pair of Tacovas, and don't go gently. All right, Utahns, here is the deal. This year, our election day is different from the rest of the country. Election day in Utah is Tuesday, November 21st. That's the Tuesday right before Thanksgiving. Why have the dates changed? Honestly, it's complicated. I'm not going to get into it. Trust me, it's fine. Here's what you need to know. To vote, you need to be registered, which you can do at vote.utah.gov by Monday, November 13th. If you vote by mail, you must postmark your ballot on or before Monday, November 20th. Or you can drop your ballot off at your county clerk's office, at a polling location, or at a drop box by 8 p.m. on Election Day, which again, this year, is Tuesday, November 21st. If you prefer to vote in person, you can find your nearest polling location at vote.utah.gov. So please, make a plan to vote local this fall. Remember to mail your ballot by November 20th and find everything you need to know about elections at vote.utah.gov. Do you want to talk about polling, Emily? I mean, listen, even though we've been hyper focused on this, it's just a municipal election. You know, like this is not something that I think the general voting public is hyped on. Right. Like it's not a presidential election year. So I don't know, Allie, you've spent more time in political campaigns. Is it standard for us to do polling in a mayoral race? I mean, I'm looking it up right now to see if we had polling between Luz and Aaron. Yeah, we did. Oh, basically around this time in 2019, the Salt Lake Tribune was sharing polling between Aaron Mendenhall and Luz Escamilla, Hmm. Senator Luz Escamilla. So we normally do get polling, if only because, I mean, polling is lucrative. It Hmm. leads to clicks. It can help with fundraising. I actually have been thinking about this because... 
Sometimes when like Dan Jones and Associates or uh, another institution, polling institution doesn't conduct its own polling, mm-hmm. candidates will pay to conduct their own polling. Right. And if you are sort of the leading contender or like an incumbent, sometimes if you feel that you're really far ahead or even if you have internal polling that shows that you're really far ahead, you don't want to release it because then your supporters might not show up to the polls. Interesting. Like they might not vote with as much enthusiasm because they think you've got it in the bag. Right. That makes sense. And when you are a contender, you know, and you're challenging an incumbent, your job is to kind of be an aggressor. Your job is to kind of throw punches. Sometimes you want internal polling because it can show how close you are and that can excite your base Mm -hmm. and also increase fundraising. Like you can use that to say, hey, we have a shot here. Let's go. Mm -hmm. And that can be really useful to you for fundraising, for getting volunteers, for making sure every single person fills out their ballot, et cetera. Listen, I'm waiting until election day to see what happens. Um, But I do want to talk about what it's like to be the incumbent in a mayoral race. Because, Allie, I think that, and this is also speaking for myself, prior to my experience in this line of work, I didn't know anything about how cities worked. Okay, And uh, frankly, I'm still learning every single day how cities work. But I think that a lot of people shake their fist at the incumbent mayor for everything. Lots of things are in their control, right? The buck stops with them, ultimately. They're the CEO of the city. But some things are not in their control. And I'm wondering if it's easy to be like, you know what? I hate walking down this sidewalk. It hasn't been fixed all the 10 years I've lived here or whatever. It's the mayor's fault. I'm not going to vote for them. Do you think incumbency hurts or helps a mayor? I mean, I think people like a change candidate, but I think that change candidate has to be offering a real vision. If you are going to be running a campaign against an incumbent, you have to offer more than criticisms of them. Mm. You have to lay a vision for how you will coordinate a lived experience that is different and what that will look and feel like for residents of the city. So it's not just your job to throw stones. It's also your job to paint us a picture. What will a day in the life look like under a different administration? And if people have a hard time imagining it as being better, (laughs) then it's harder to earn their vote. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, we do kind of like what we know. I mean, on the other hand, voters don't vote to say thank you. (laughs) Hmm. They just don't. People do not vote to say thank you. I mean, there is a reason that we have seen people win even though they have sponsored unpopular policies. There is a reason that we've seen people lose even though they've had some big wins. Like, Getting voters to turn out because they're outraged about something, Mm -hmm. I think, is a little bit easier than getting them to turn out to say thank you. But I don't know. That's just me. I mean, what do you think? That's really interesting. I think generally what elections show us is that being the incumbent really helps because of name ID mostly, right? Like you see Mayor Aaron Mendenhall's name in the news all the time. There are some ways in which standing in office makes campaigning easier. I mean, like, think about next year, we're going to have a governor's race. Mm -hmm. You know, Governor Cox is still going to get to do his monthly news conference. Right. And he's going to be doing that as the governor. He's not going to be doing it as a candidate. So he can't be up there chanting campaign slogans. I mean, if he does something, it is news because he is the governor, right? Right. Whereas, like, if one of his challengers does something to try and generate earned media or generate a news story, it's not always going to get picked up. Like, you know, Rocky Anderson can't stand on the steps of the hall and have a press conference once a week. He could, but the press isn't going to go to that every week. It's not news if he has an idea. He's not the mayor. In terms of issues, we have talked extensively on this show about homelessness. So let's put that aside for a second. What other issues are coming up in these debates 
And did you learn anything that surprised you? I mean, I know you want to set homelessness aside. And frankly, some of the moderators also wanted to set homelessness aside. Mm -hmm. But the candidates kept bringing it back to homelessness, like finding a way to make it happen, even if that wasn't the question. So homelessness was discussed at length. Um, Great Salt Lake. I don't think people would be surprised to hear about that. School closures also came up. Uh, The I-15 expansion came up. General housing affordability, water conservation, like these sorts of issues that I think we do understand to be Salt Lake City issues. What I was surprised by, Allie, and you and I were both so surprised that we had to dig into this more, was the fact that two different moderators brought up the possibility of the Utah Jazz leaving downtown Salt Lake City. <laughs> yeah. And we have a whole show on that. We'll link it in the show notes for you. But that was something that... I guess like I didn't get very satisfying answers from the candidates on. I feel like it's something that Aaron Mendenhall surely knows the most about as the current mayor. But because of that, like the other candidates didn't really have much to say. Um, The question was usually like, how would you keep the Utah Jazz in downtown Salt Lake City? And... I feel like instead, the other candidates, Michael Valentine and Rocky Anderson, uh, again, were just like lobbing bombs, you know, like this is a failure of the Mendenhall administration if we saw the jazz leave and, you know, that that sort of thing. Hmm. So nothing really satisfying from the other candidates, but it did surprise me each time it came up. I mean, I haven't been to all of these debates. I've only been reading and listening to coverage. But it's interesting to hear you say that they brought every issue back to homelessness. And yet something that I feel like we haven't been talking about very holistically in this election cycle is poverty. Hmm. Like, I couldn't think of one thing that any of these candidates is offering as a policy solution to poverty. We've heard the mayor say, Mayor Mendenhall say, the solution to homelessness is housing. But how do we keep people like upstream? What kinds of things can we be doing as a city that are preventative, that, that prevent people from poverty, like experiencing poverty? And I don't know. There is part of me that's like, it's always interesting to have single issue campaigning because you get a little bit of depth on issues. But I also wonder if we can't see the forest for the trees right now. Anybody talking about poverty at these debates? Well, I think it all comes down to what the city can actually control, right? Is it something that they can address? I don't know. When Mm -hmm. we ask Mayor Mendenhall bringing it back again to homelessness, specifically what the city's role was, that role was quite limited in the way she described it, right? It was zoning and land use, funding, and convening partners on this issue. So I don't know. We didn't hear any big ideas when it comes to poverty in particular. I mean, I will say sometimes I tune into debates just because, just for the dramatization of it all, which is indulgent and embarrassing of me. But like, who are these for? Like, do you think that anyone was swayed by these conversations? No, Allie, I don't think that at all. And so I am wondering, is it just for the drama? Do voters really tune into these shows these performances to decide who they're going to vote for i don't know that they do and so i'm wondering like in the end what does sway voters because you and i have talked about yard signs you and i have talked Mm -hmm. about endorsements yeah and i think we've decided that neither of those things really work to change people's minds or help them make a decision so what does help voters make a decision I don't know. We should probably ask Ken Bone, the lone undecided voter from 2016. (laughs) (laughs) But listen, at the same time, I do think there's value, Allie, in getting all the candidates in a room together where they can defend their views and, you know, what, what, what do we call this? The marketplace of ideas or something like that. And... I mean, it helps me to see them all right next to each other and how they respond to the same situation. But does it change people's minds? I'm not sure that it does. I mean, the reality is elected officials spend a lot of time behind closed doors and there is value in forcing some of these conversations into the public square. I think you're right. I completely agree. But 
I got to tell you, Emily, I'm going to peel back the curtain a little bit here. I get a lot of texts from friends, from people who might even be more acquaintances that I haven't like hung out with in a while, asking me who they should vote for. Hmm. And I think that word of mouth I think the influence of friends and neighbors, maybe family less so because it's easier to disagree with them, is really, really powerful. Yeah. Just a reminder that election day is Tuesday, November 21st. And it could take a while for us to get results because we're ranked choice voting. It could also happen really quickly. We don't really know what to expect on that front, but uh, plan to rest your eyes the day after election day and getting the results when the time is right. And we'll keep you updated when we do, when we get them. Emily Means, thank you so much for going to all of these debates. You deserve a treat. (laughs) Thanks, Sally. (laughs) If you think Salt Lake City's mayoral election has been drawn out, look no further north than Ogden for comfort. At the start of this year, the city had seven mayoral candidates vying for the outgoing mayor's seat. After a primary election in the summer, they're down to two, Taylor Knuth and Ben Nadalski. Nadalski played football at Weber State and is a current member of the Ogden City Council. He's also an employee of the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources. Knuth is a Weber State grad as well who's had a career in nonprofit management. He currently serves as deputy director of the Salt Lake City Arts Council. Now, if you live in Ogden, KUER has a great voter guide to the two candidates. I linked it in the show notes for you. You'll be not so surprised to hear some of the key issues in this race, homelessness, housing, policing, and the crisis at the Great Salt Lake. But KUER asked both candidates one question that I feel is extremely insightful. Ready for it? Who is your dream performer on the Ogden Twilight stage? For Knuth, Taylor Swift. For Nadalski, Luke Bryan. That is all for us today here on CityCast Salt Lake. Thank you for listening. We will be back tomorrow morning with more from around this city. Bye.